The Lord be with you. And also with you. Well, wonderful to see all of you here, and so grateful that you braved uh, the cold of January uh, to come and be with us in this warm place. Hopefully, uh, your heart and soul will be uh, satisfied uh, and warm by the time you leave here today. If you are a guest of the house and would like more information about who we are, uh, please raise your hand. We will quickly give you a packet of material to uh, explain something more about our faith family. So are there visitors to the house? No, it looks like all the visitors are still home in bed. Okay. <laughs> or they're watching us online. Hello. <laughs> anyway, glad that you're here. A uh, couple of announcements and then uh, we'll be on our way. Uh, one is there is no women's Bible study now until uh, February. So you have a couple of more weeks left without any weekly Bible study until uh, February. We will resume then. Uh, grief Share uh, begins next Saturday uh, here on uh, the 20th at 9.30 a.m. Uh, this is a very fine program that uh, is very encouraging to people who are going through the grief journey. And there's a lot more information about it online. Uh, you, can get, you can see it on our website, also on our Facebook page, or you can talk to Don Egoff if you have, or Mira Eats if you have more questions. So uh, please think about that and pre pray for those who will be coming. Uh, next Sunday, January the 21st, is our State of the Parish uh, Sunday. It's just a time to uh, pause for a moment and reflect on who we are by God's grace uh, as a congregation and perhaps envision what God wants us to be, needs us to be in this place called Rehoboth. So that will happen after the late service. Uh, there will be a lunch served, but it is a working lunch. In other words, you're not going to sit and listen to a bunch of people talk. Uh, you're going to be the ones actually doing the talking. Uh, so uh, please encourage I encourage you to come and be part of that. There are two sign-up sheets out there. One is for those attending, uh, and the other is for those who might be willing to help serve and clean up and all those good things that come to happen. But I'm very excited about this, and I hope that you'll come and be excited about it too. Uh, you're entering, you're just beginning to enter the whole new chapter of ministry here, uh, and it's important that. Everybody is kind of on the same page. Also, next Sunday, the 21st, is another Giving Sunday. So we had a Giving Sunday a month plus ago, uh, and you brought in 613 food items on that one Sunday, which is pretty amazing. You're a very generous group. Uh, this time, though, we're not asking you to think about bringing in food, but more socks, hats, gloves, scarves, all adult size. And so if you can bring those things in, and there'll be a table set up out there. Uh, there are an awful lot of people in our community who are in an awful lot of need. So uh, this is a very, uh, a very tenuous time in our community with a lot of the businesses being closed and so on. So it's a, it's a hard moment. So please consider uh, bringing in those things. Um, I think that's enough. So if we will, Jerry and Manny, please.
Please remove the bill. Please remain and see that uh, we'd like to invite Donna Egoff up uh, to share just a little bit of uh, thought about stewardship because uh, part of what's going on on the 21st next Sunday is a lead into stewardship. What gifts has God given to you and how are you using them? So, Don, if you would, please. Good morning. My name is Donna Eagle, and I've been asked to speak on stewardship. For me personally, serving has been an ongoing mission. But as a young person, I was unaware of that's what I was doing. I attended Sunday school and joined the junior choir. And then as a young mother, I worked with children in Sunday school. And I was a member of the Christian Nurses Association, learning how to bring Christ in prayer to my patients. Bruce and I came to LCOS in 1993 and we were involved in teaching Sunday school and later the youth group. In 2021, we participated in a servant event in North Carolina with Pastor Schaefer and his crew, and we worked with a great group of young people, about 48 of them, six of whom were from our church. We installed siding, dug ditches, installed septic systems, and getting to interact with the people from Appalachia was a great gift to me. Being able to praise God through our great, our awesome minister, uh, music ministry and honoring him by preparing and assisting with Eucharist is humbling. I love art, so I was led to help with the decorations here during the holidays. Each one of these ministries has touched my heart in a special way. We are never too young or too old to serve. It's our privilege. We love God. This congregation has been very generous with their resources. We need to continue moving forward. God wants us to use these gifts to touch the hearts of the people that we are serving. I never thought I would be involved with a grief ministry or a women's shelter, but God had other plans. And there it was, and I knew it was a God thing. This has not only been a blessing to the people involved, but to me as well. When you see the hand of God at work, touching the lives of others, whether it's through music, Eucharist, Sunday school, someone crying on your shoulder, or having a warm, safe, dry place for someone to sleep, and yes, even building a septic system in Appalachia, you will be blessed in a way that you cannot imagine. God gives us our time and our talent and everything we have. He loves us so much. Please take a step and get involved. Try something new. But most of all, plant a seed and tell someone God loves them and see what the Holy Spirit will do. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Donna, for sharing your thoughts. If you're able, I invite you to rise as we begin our praise of a very gracious God. As always, we make our strong beginning in the name of God the Father, and of God the Son, and of God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we join together in prayer. Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, most merciful Redeemer, for the countless blessings and benefits you give. May we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more dearly, day by day, praising you with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please remain standing for the singing of the songs. One, two, three, four.
brothers and sisters, in life we face difficult choices. Let us pause to reflect on how we have often wrongly responded, but how God in his mercy has been faithful to his promises. Let us take a moment of silence to reflect on how we've been living our lives in these last several days. God of light and darkness, we have seen the glimmer of your starlight beckoning to us, but we have turned away and followed other paths. We confess that we have not loved you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us, Holy One. Strengthen our faltering steps and guide us in your holy way of peace. Amen. My friends, this is the good news. The light of God comes not to sear and blind us, but to save us. Christ Jesus came into this world to save people like you and people like me. In his name I declare to you, your sins are indeed forgiven. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of the lessons. <laughs> the lessons assigned to be read on this, the second Sunday in the season of Epiphany, begin with a lesson from the Old Testament, and this is from the book, the first book of Samuel. It is really the call of Samuel, who will become a prophet and who would be involved in a lot of the things that went on in the history of Israel in the Old Testament including the coronation of a couple of kings. But on this day, the focus is on Samuel as a child and hearing God's invitation for him to serve and finally uh, accepting that invitation. And the punchline, if you will, at the end is probably one we should use as our own punchline as well. Servant, your, uh, Lord, your servant is speak, your servant is listening. Reminds us to always be open to what God may be leading us to be involved in and doing in his name and for his purpose. First uh, Samuel chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the, where the ark of God was. Mm -hmm. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And then he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me? But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lie down. Again the Lord said, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, said Eli, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The third time the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lie down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The New Testament reading is from the pen of St. Paul as he writes to the house church in first century Corinth. Corinth in the first century was a huge seaport. It was sort of a gathering place for people from all over the world. 
if you want to think of it, think of it as a combination of New York City and Las Vegas all at once. <laughs> so lots of stuff was going on that wasn't exactly right and certainly was not driven by any moral compass. And so uh, Paul takes great pains to point out to the Corinthian Christians, don't be like that. But the deeper issue here is he's really trying to explain to them the concept of Christian freedom. What does it mean to be free in Christ from the burden of keeping commandments which you can't keep? Well, it means to be free from something in order to be free for something. In other words, free not to do everything you want, but free to serve others in Christ's name and for his purpose. 1 Corinthians 6, beginning at verse 12. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and stomach for the food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her body? For it is said, the two shall become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All the other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise if you are able to hear the word of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is given to us this morning from the witness of St. John, the first chapter beginning at the 43rd verse. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. And finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Did anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And then Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. We join our hearts and our voices together in affirming our faith in this Christ. I believe in one God, united on high, ruler of the heavens and the earth, full of grace and mercy. I believe in the Father who has created me in all existence. I believe in the Son, who has redeemed me by his death and resurrection. By my baptism into his name, I am saved from sin, death, and the power of the devil. He, Lord of God and man, my Lord Jesus Christ, is now seated at the right hand of the Father. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who daily sanctifies me. He blesses me and guides me. As I live my life in the body of Christ, the one true holy apostolic church. On the last day, he will gather me and all believers, even raising them from the dead, into heaven, where I will live in holiness and blessedness forever. Amen. Maybe see
for the singing of the song. <laughs> this day and always because of our Lord Jesus Christ. The text is the gospel lesson read a few moments ago, so far in the text. From the time that we are very young until the time that we are very old, we are invited to be part of something. Some invitations we expect to receive, other invitations Catch us by surprise. Some invitations we eagerly accept right away, and others, well, we have to think about it for a while. Our country on this weekend, especially tomorrow, is honoring the memory of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. If you think about all of his words and all of his actions, he really was offering an invitation. He was inviting people to look at things in a different way. He was inviting them to act and to react to things that had been going on for a very long time. And to meet violence with nonviolence. And to meet hate with love. Dr. King's legacy is still going on, and the people who accepted his invitation and who yet do, are the ones who are making significant changes in the way we see each other and the way we think about each other in our society. In our text for this morning, we focus on Philip, who was the third called disciple. He meets up with his friend Nathaniel and encourages him, invites him to come to Jesus. Nathaniel's initial response is skepticism tinged with not a small amount of sarcasm. Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because at the time, Nazareth was an insignificant town way up in the hills. Nothing important ever happened there. But in response, Philip does not try to pressure Nathaniel nor does he try to launch a defense of why he believes Jesus to be the Messiah, nor does he compromise. He simply looks at Nathaniel and says, come and see. And with that invitation, Nathaniel finally comes and meets Jesus for himself, and in that meeting, suddenly then, all the doubts are gone, and discipleship had just begun. Philip's approach to sharing his faith in the first century, I think, offers some helpful insights for we who are trying to share our faith in the 21st century, to a society who is really has the mindset of Nathaniel. Christianity? What good can come out of Christianity? We inside of this building believe that this is the greatest news that the world has ever heard about a God who is and a God who cares and a God whose love is incessant and unconditional for all people. But our heart 
hearts are reconciled with God for now and forever. What could be better than that? And we believe that in our baptism, we are called to invite others to find you and to know the joy that we have found. But our experience teaches us that there is a truth to that old idiom, never discuss politics or religion. We certainly can share very easily and talk with each other about things that happen to us commonly over which we have no control. Last week again, just like always, there was a reasonable storm here, far less than it was in other places in the region. But still, people were eager to talk to each other and to get online and to converse with each other, saying, this is what I saw, this is what I experienced. Oh my gosh, there were you know, flooded roads and there were tree limbs down. You can't believe the chaos. And all the things we talked about were met with a sympathetic ear. On the other hand, if you make comments about politics or religion in our divided society right now, you're probably going to be met with a fierce debate or a spirited defense not in the same place on those things. And it would seem that in our society, in our moment in time, people have a pretty clear idea about what they think is true and what they think is not true. And they're not easily persuaded to think in a new way. And perhaps that's especially true when it comes to religion. Just like Nathaniel, there are an awful lot of people beyond these walls who are very wary and very distrustful of what we proclaim and what the gospel says. Christianity, what good can come from that? Some of their feeling that way is fueled by uh, bad experiences with people who purport to be Christian. Some of their experiences with watching what the church as institution does, or sadly what priests and pastors do sometimes, they make terrible mistakes. Sometimes, of course, they're feeling this kind of wariness comes from just what they've read on the internet, and well, because it's on the internet, it must be true. You never quite know where somebody's heart is. So you may remember several weeks ago, I mentioned that while I was doing cardiac rehab after my heart surgery this fall, uh, this person came up to me one day who was also there and they saw that I had a clergy shirt on and they asked if I were a priest. And I said, well, no, I'm serving the Lutheran church and her response at the time was, oh, Lutheran. Well, that's better than nothing. <laughs> Well, two weeks ago, in my last cardiac rehab exercise, I finished up and I was sitting there cooling down and the same person saw me and sat down next to me. And this time they said, how many converts did you make over Christmas in the services of the church? I really had to think about that one. <laughs> And I said, honestly, I don't know if anybody was converted to Christianity's faith. It would be delightful if they were. All I know is I did the best that I could, and I prayed that hearts would be opened to listening and to hearing the gospel that I feebly was trying to proclaim. And they looked at me and said, I like that. Hearts open. Yeah, that's good. And they stood up and walked away. I had no idea why they asked me that question. But I tried to respond following the example of Philip. When Philip is met with Nathaniel's uh, uh, dubious thought about Nazareth, he does not trot out a bunch of Bible verses. He does not suggest that if Nathaniel doesn't quickly believe, he's going to hell. He does not advocate denominational loyalty, you know, we're the best church, not them. 
He does not judge that person's background, nor does he criticize what where Nathaniel is in his life right now. Philip reminds us that our job is simply to invite. We don't convert anybody. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Philip didn't convert Nathaniel. Jesus converted Nathaniel. And so it continues even today. Our job is to open the door, just to offer people a glimpse of the grace of God that perhaps they've never known or experienced before. And as always, it's far better done with actions than words. Pious words count for little. Acts of compassion count for a lot. We have no control over how they will respond to what we try to share. Some may nod politely and walk away vowing never to talk to us again. Some may shun us, some may ridicule us, some may cast doubt on what we believe. Yes, we never quite know where they are. We don't know what's in their heart. You can never look into somebody else's soul in a full, free, truly way. But we do it anyway. We persist. And we have persisted for over 20 centuries. In 1982, the phrase, practice random acts of kindness, began showing up on bumper stickers. That phrase was not Christian in origin, but we certainly could adopt it as a sort of now mantra for us. And truly, Christians are not the only ones on the planet practicing random or intentional acts of kindness. But the motivation behind what we do is always driven by faith. We don't do the stuff that we do trying to look good in society. We don't try to look, do it to look, gain brownie points with God. We're certainly not expecting that people are going to laud and applaud us for being the nice people that we are. We do it because we have experienced God's love in a deep way, in a personal way. And that love compels us to share that love with everyone around us, <coughs> simply, gratefully, persistently. It's interesting that Nathaniel only shows up one more time in John's Gospel, chapter 21, verse 2. He's listed among those who went fishing after Good Friday. So you think maybe he was one of the disciples, although the jury is still out on that, we'll never know. He might have been Bartholomew, he might have been St. James the Less, nobody's quite sure. The point is Nathaniel quickly fades into obscurity. The sad truth is that when you and I are finished with our life on this planet, you and I, quickly fade into obscurity too. We might be remembered by a very few for a very short time. But then we're nothing. But if while we lived on this planet, our words, our actions, were living in accordance of inviting other people to experience the joy of the gospel hope, then indeed we will have lived as Jesus intended. And finally think about this. Nobody is born being a Christian. You're invited to become one by somebody else. That's how it works. And then you in your brief moment of time invite others to find the joy that you have found. And then you pray that those who follow us will be willing to share that joy and invite others too. For the past 21 centuries, the litany has always been the same. Come and see. May that be so in your life and in mine. Let the people of God say, Amen. Amen.
As always, we come to the moment in worship when we take Jesus seriously about praying, and so we do. And among those we are praying for, especially today, are Joyce Fandel, relative of Jerry Baldwin, who has been hospitalized. We're asked to pray for Brooks Tanner, grandson of Colleen Kirchhoff, who is going through yet some more upcoming surgeries in his very young life. We pray for Debbie Glanville, sister-in-law of J. and Debbie Wisman, who has had a recurrence of cancer and is being treated for that again. We pray for those who are uh, mourning on this day. We pray especially for Pat Barnes, her brother, brother Charlie Goodyear, who died last night. We also pray for Jan and Vicki Scholl, who are up in New Jersey today for the funeral of Billy Scholl, a member of their family. There will be another service for Mr. Scholl down here uh, that will be announced. But pray for them that uh, God's Spirit would give them peace for the day. We're praying for those who are celebrating milestones in life, uh, for Pat Horwath, Don Minion, Nancy Smith, and Don Kelshaw, and also anniversaries, Ted and Carol Thayer. Did you know that, Ted? <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. So, uh, then for these and others, we pray. Gracious God, who in every age invites us to be reconciled with you, we pray that in our day and time, we might offer that same invitation to those around us. We are grateful for all of the people who have invited us in our life to come and see. And today we remember especially Martin Luther King, whose whole life was an invitation to love rather than hate. May our words and actions likewise mirror your grace in a very broken and conflicted world. Let our lives speak truthfully, act kindly, always being driven by humble and grateful hearts. In the place and moment where we find ourselves inspire, enlighten, and enable us to incarnate the truth of the gospel hope. Let us not be deterred by criticism or despair but faithfully live out what you command. For the country and the world beyond these doors, we ask for courage and grace to offer our little piece of grace and compassion through how we live. Help us to see ourselves, Lord, as ambassadors of reconciliation and grace. And this week, we ask a special measure of that grace to be with those among this faith family who are in need. And today we pray especially for Joyce. Joyce. For Debbie, Debbie, for Brooks, Brooks. Lift them up where they need to be lifted, encourage and strengthen them for the place where they are. With your love, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, especially for those who are mourning on this day. We pray for Pat. Pat. And we pray for Jan and Vicki. Jan and Vicki. May they find strength and courage for the journey of grieving and the resurrection hope and promise. Inspire and encourage them, O oh God, for the moment beyond this one. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those who are marking this day and week as life milestones, and may the joy in this moment strengthen them for the journey ahead. We ask that you might bless them with humor, courage, and grace enough for the traveling time. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for this congregation that it may be a place offering solace and peace to those who come through these doors. <clears throat> may we welcome and embrace the stranger among us. And finally, be in our own hearts be open through this worship and participation in the Eucharist, so that we leave here today stronger in faith than when we came in. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we join together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. I encourage you to share that peace enthusiastically with each other. In the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took a cup of the wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave that to them, saying, Take and drink of this, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you now and always. Amen. Amen. May be seated.
Son, that this is the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. Though this is the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. Jeremy, this is the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. Daddy, this is the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. Daddy, the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. Jerry, this is the body of Christ given for you. Daddy, this is the body of Christ that is given for you. Take and eat. Fred, this is the body of Christ that is given for you. Take and eat. Amen. May indeed the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ evermore strengthen and preserve you in faith until your life everlasting. Depart in his peace and for his service. Amen.
May indeed the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ evermore strengthen and preserve you in faith until your life everlasting. Depart in his peace and for his service. Amen. Amen. And if I should rise. <laughs> and indeed, may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and always. Amen. 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 One, two, three, four. <laughs> Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.